Hello, everyone. Welcome to Podtackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I'm your host, Dust Storm. And I'm your co-host, Godzilla T. And I'm another guy. <laughs> the other guy being Toa Freak or Halo Cannon. Welcome back, guys. We are here to talk about another episode of Hunt the Truth. We got it so quickly. <laughs> We're just kind of right yeah. in full steam ahead here. This is crazy. Like I was at work about to leave for, like, go out and get some lunch, and it's like, you know, check the Twitter feed. I'll check that quickly. Oh my god, season two, or episode one. <laughs> Up already? What the hell? Yeah. That it was the same l- thing. I saw something on Twitter, and I'm like, no. And I looked, and sure enough, there it is. Yeah, we weren't expecting this one to come out quite as quickly. But as... You know, as content comes out, we got to flex our schedules. So we're here doing another <laughs> episode two days after the pilot episode of Hunt the Truth Season 2. <laughs> oh, gosh. So suddenly that makes me think when Noah, went, like last episode, when he said no, uh, Noah, the creative director, was in the chat, he said he was working on the next episode. <laughs> I guess he was working on getting that one out. While we were <laughs> breaking out his first episode, he was I know, busy right? the next one. I can only imagine that now he's working on episode number two as we're working on this podcast. And that'll come out All, Saturday. No. Yeah. All uh, I gotta say is the man's a master multitasker. Yeah. So he true. Was listening to our podcast, active in the chat, and editing this podcast, editing Hunt the Truth all at the same time, he's a really good multitasker because he did an <laughs> awesome job. Indeed. Along, I, and along I think, with everybody else. Oh, yeah. And, and we got Crash back in the chat. So, oh, he's working on episode three now is, is what, we've, what we've been informed. So he's, he's a little more ahead of the game, which is good, which is good. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about episode one. And this isn't going to be like an episode every other day. Bravo did come out and answer someone's tweet earlier and say that the episodes are going to be scheduled to come out on Tuesday. We just, it was a weird week this week because they wanted to start on Tuesday and they, I guess they're trying to squeeze a couple of them in. So they went ahead and did one today on Thursday. So we're, we're juggling around our podcast a little bit. We're not doing our last light discussion. We're going to be bumping that for at least another week, maybe two weeks. Cause that kind of jumbles up our schedule for next week as well. Since we'll be discussing episode two on Tuesday of Hunt the Truth Season 2, and we're supposed to be having the guys from the 405th on next week to talk about cosplay in Halo. So that's going to be a wonderful episode. I highly recommend you guys tune into that one, especially if you've been interested in looking at building your own armor, weapon props, anything related to making your own like set pieces within the Halo realm. The 405th is the source to go to, so we're going to have them on the podcast to talk about their adventures into actually making some of these uh, costumes, outfits, props, armor, all that stuff, what it's like to going to conventions, all that good stuff. So highly recommend you check that one out next Thursday. And we'll obviously be here on Tuesday next week to talk about episode two. But right now, we're here to talk about episode one of season two. This was eye-opening. And they were not kidding when they said the episodes were going to be long. I have... Literally two pages of written notes on this episode. I don't know how you go through your stuff, Ian, but <laughs> m- my hand probably started to hurt after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I dissected this thing for probably an hour and a half. Yeah. I mean, like, I've already recorded my episode on it, so, but, uh-huh. and while it is shorter, there is definitely a lot more content. A lot of the, you know, the last episode, my last breakdown was just, yeah, mostly just kind of covering some of the video content. So this uh, this episode content wise was just insane. And there's just so much stuff that they're kind of revealing behind stuff that's going on within Hunt the Truth that explains stuff that happened in season one. And now we're kind of setting up for season two. And I think in this episode, we really start to see the tie in with Halo 5 Guardians and some of the other videos that we've been seeing pop up over the last few days on social media and on the website as well. And we'll get into those a little in a little bit, but initial reactions to this first episode, I think there was a lot of Holy crap. WTF moments 
just listening to this. I know there is definitely a few times, especially when we we see the state that Ben is in, and then we actually get to see some of the other characters that get introduced in episode one. And there's just a lot of those like, oh my gosh, this is actually happening in this series. There's so many tie-ins from the rest of the fiction. It's awesome. Oh, they're all over the place. Oh my god, yes. And a few of them I even missed like my initial br- my when I was writing down some initial thoughts. A few people on Twitter pointed out some things, but you know, we'll talk about that when we get to that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So let's just go ahead and jump right into this. So we have after the pilot episode, they're taking Maya to Midnight Facility, which we have heard of in the Halo universe before. There's been a couple of other mentions of it in the past. Um, I believe there was a mention of it in, throughout the Kilo 5 trilogy and mm-hmm. maybe in one of the Halo Evolution stories, if I'm not mistaken. Mistaken? Uh, Halo Escalation. Escalation? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's where, um, I thought there might have been another one, too, say, where it got a reference. Maybe not. Maybe they did. And I, just, it, I mean, it escal- or, uh, not Escalation. Evolutions came out in 2009. And like looking yeah. back on that, there's a ton of references to... I guess the first time may have been just Kilo recently. Five. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, that's yeah, true. So it's like, otherwise, it's Thursday War and Halo Escalation because Daniel Clayton's there. Yeah, there's a couple other people that have been sent there as well, but this is the first time we kind of actually have a, a full expose of of Midnight Facility. So it's a secret Oni penitentiary that's in the middle of an asteroid belt in the middle of freaking nowhere we have no idea where exactly it is but it's pretty well hidden that we know of it's not um to maya's point not one of the ones that is mostly well known it's not one of those ones where you say the name and it instantly strikes fear into the heart of enemies like federalist or imperialist enemies or yeah so it's not one of those kind of things it's definitely a place where people go to disappear so very under the wraps, very no one knows about type thing. So Maya goes, talks about as they're approaching Midnight Facility, as they're on the Pelican, how she was going over the footage of her extraction, forcing herself to watch people die because of the operation that she's running there. Um, she has to verify all the casualties, and you could hear that she was just watching the footage over and over and over again, just to make sure that it sunk in. Yeah, it's it, it's amazing. Well, it's interesting that she's going over all this with her being an Oni agent. It kind of leans towards you know, what we were discussing Tuesday about her being confused about who she is. Uh huh. You know, as an Oni agent, I mean, she would probably look at look at it and say, okay, well, all right, well, this is what happened and okay, done. But she keeps going over and over and over and over it, uh, you know, time and time again, looking for people she knows. And when she does, and when she finds like one person that who did survive, I think it was like, she said it was like one of her, her like right hand men or something. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's like, oh, thank God he survived. Yeah. He's an any, but thank God he survived. Well, being five years in the position that she's yeah, in, yeah. you're going to grow attached to the people that you're working with. Yeah, it's natural human, in, you know, basic human, uh, whatever, yeah. I can't think of the word. <laughs> in, instinct? I, I, like, I want kind of, to say instinct, but I know that's not the right word. It's like, um, yeah, but it's almost like, it might not be, whatever. It's basic human instinct. Let's go with it. I, I know what you're trying to get at. I, maybe someone in the chat knows what we we're trying to think of. But yeah, it, she said the name of the person was Wick. Uh, we didn't get a last name. But she said that a friend and her right hand man in the uh, in the insurrectionists or for for the group that she was a part of. But as they're approaching midnight, it's uh, an asteroid that's completely just hidden within an asteroid belt. You wouldn't even know that anything is within the asteroid unless you knew it was there. And she mentions that there's enough firepower in midnight facility to take out an entire covenant fleet. That's a lot of armaments. Was it fleet or armada? Uh, the guy's name was Bostwick. Bostwick. Yeah. I oh. guess human nature might be might be closer to what we were saying. Whatever though. Yeah, thanks, Pins. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that kind of compassion that just 
Yeah. You kind of mm-hmm. after five years, you, you just can't help but not feel for someone that you're working close with, even if you are undercover. Oh, the typical Hollywood spy story. Anyways, <laughs> this is why they should all be sociopaths. They, then they don't have to form connections. That would make for a very boring story in this case. So good thing that she's. Not. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. So as they get to midnight, the, it, there's a secret passageway in. There's a, a long tunnel that they're guided in. And then they finally get to the hangar. And it's this gigantic hangar that is completely empty. Hundred foot walls, big ceiling. And just there's nothing there in, in the hangar. I mean, it, you wouldn't expect that there's a lot of to and from there anyway, being one of the most top secret federal penitentiaries in the UNSC's or ONI's arsenal. So it, that's no surprise, but they, they get there. She's well, obviously a little jerked, like a little like snapping out of things when they, when they say commander, we're about to arrive. She's like, Oh, okay. okay. Cause she's still trying to take in the fact that yes, these people have died. <laughs> these people that have grown, that she's grown close to. And, She's trying to f- just constantly remind herself that, yes, this is her job. This is what she is charged with doing and that there are going to be casualties with her op. Yeah, the uh, to the point of the hangar, I would think that they would want to be able to hide, uh, you know, like an Oni Corvette in there, too, you know, that's dropping off supplies or prisoners. So like Dr. That, Halsey, maybe, maybe. But I to to the point of the size of the hangar yeah. and the fact that it was empty, that's probably why they have such a huge hangar. And with her bolstering herself to say to it almost seems like she's trying to convince herself that she's still an Oni agent. Right. And you can definitely tell throughout this episode that she's starting to really or she has over the last five years start to really rub off on what she's been going through and like her five years of service has really kind of changed her perspective on things, which is kind of the whole point of this season two. I think we kind of see how she has changed and then it's the whole setup for what's happening in Halo five as well. So definitely a lot of uh, interesting character development we're going to see in that season two. I'm sure uh, when they got into the hangar, she quickly got off the Pelican as, as fast as possible and Aside from just the emptiness of the hangar bay, there were lights on the ground directing them to walk to two sm- small doors, uh, one of the sides of the, the hangar. And uh, in the background, you hear uh, one of the ODST uh, squad leaders saying that this is a dark mission. Make sure that like no one knows about it, yada, yada, yada. And then the uh, I think it was the same ODST that was mouthing off to her in the pilot episode, the Lance Corporal, he makes a witty remark saying, you're welcome. And she says, for what? And or, you're welcome, Pharaoh. So calling out the actual, like who she's supposed to be pretending as. And then he's basically saying for saving your, saving your ass. And she says, she doesn't remember this, but she completely just takes a, a swing at the guy. Yeah. <laughs> she I knocks just... his butt on the floor. Yeah. And, and from the sound of it, she probably broke something in his jaw or loosened a tooth at least. But I, I played that moment over, like, I don't know how many, I lost count how many times because it's just so great. I, I love the line, I don't remember hitting him. Yes. Yeah, but you can hear a nice thud. I, I would oh, think man. your hand would remind you that you hit him. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's some, some moments of rage where you probably don't remember. One of the other things that she made the comment about was that that's a very same Marine that was mouthing or ODST with that was mouthing off to her yeah. was wiping blood off his shoe you know, like it was nothing. I don't know if that was the same ODST or she just noticed another ODST doing that because I think the the way it sounded to me, it was that same that same ODST. At least that's what it sounded like to me. Maybe it was a different one. Because I thought Wiley was like one of the ODSTs that was specific, like part of a team, which was to get her out. And then there was Bravo team that was well, no, I guess not because the Bravo, yeah, Bravo team probably team wouldn't was go the back. The one that was doing the cleanup, right? But when, I would assume the cleanup guys would be the ones with the, the blood on their boots. Well, no, Alpha well, went other, in too, so yeah, yeah they I did guess end to pull her out into the crowd. So That's, yeah, yep, same ODST, Wiley. Yeah, we just got confirmation. <laughs> 
So yeah, ODST with a a smug grin, witty remarks, and Maya just kind of lays him out. And of course, he wants to come back and retaliate, but the squad leader says, "Stand down!" And, and you know, like you know that she's ready to pick a fight. He's ready to pick a fight because he's an ODST. So, but the, the ODST squad leader calls him down, and and then she quickly goes away is greeted by the facility AI and is informed that you are expected on floor, floor number 18. And Captain Rybeck, or Noah, as we heard from episode one, is expecting you for, for what is assumedly a, a debrief of what's been, been going on. But yeah, I would be in the... Uh, if I wasn't afraid of Pharaoh before, hearing her just kind of completely lay out an ODST, I would be now. Yeah, pretty much. Definitely. So after she gets prompted by the AI that where she's supposed to go, she decides to take a detour. She asks to go down to the cubes and the AI is like, well, you're supposed to be going here. And um, she presents clearance. And then the AI is like, OK, um, follow the, the waypoint to where you uh, want to go. So she asks to go down to the cubes and she goes to cube B349, which is actually the title of this episode. And the prisoner that's in there, she sees him sitting cross-legged on, on the floor with a, a pen and, to her surprise, an actual sheet of paper. And this is, uh, she explains that the most hated man on Earth, the symbol of hope to protesters in the outer colonies and what has become of a brave journalist who was framed, this is Ben Jero. So we, we know what happened to Ben after he was taken away from last season. He went to Midnight Facility, went into a deep, deep, dark hole, and yeah. now he is in solitary confinement, writing on pieces of paper. It was like true. I mean, there's a lot of heart wrenching moments that are coming up, but that really did for me. Like that moment, the way he's scrawling, he's like, "No, no, no I'm not done yet. It, it still needs editing." Yeah, yeah. So, you got that little bit of just that little twist of insanity. Yeah, in his rant. Like he's talking to, well, he's talking to somebody that isn't there. But the fact that when I heard it, I honestly kind of sighed a breath of relief that Ben didn't just disappear, disappear. Yeah, that's like, true. <laughs> never to be seen again. So I'm glad that they chose to put him in the midnight facility and bring him into this, into the second season. <clears throat> yeah. Even if it only ends up being just this episode, hopefully we can like see something else. But still, yeah. it was like it was good to have that nice bit of follow up. Especially, I think that makes up probably about half the episode. This whole mm -hmm. encounter that we're about to get into. Oh yeah, well, one half of a, of a bigger half, I guess, of what's actually happening to yeah. Ben. Because there's another half of this, which was kind of another surprise of what's going on. There's just a lot of. It's weird because yeah. there's a lot of <laughs> lot of characters that are being brought in, but we're seeing a lot of the same characters pop up very mm -hmm. strangely or coincidentally. And he is ben a popular one. letter in this episode. Yeah, <laughs> I like. See what you did there, but yeah, I I pretty much once you heard her describing who it was, you pretty much knew it was Ben. Mm -hmm. But I th I think what kind of got me about her encounter with Ben was something that happened a, a little later on near, near the end of their interaction, but not to skip mm -hmm. too far ahead. And so she was watching him basically kind of jot some stuff down on a piece of paper. And like, she was kind of talking through how she had promised all the Indies that she would eventually try to free Ben and that he was a symbol of hope for them. So it was obviously important to them. And he, she was basically going there to like face her fears and let Ben just completely rip her a new one for putting him in the situation that she did for feeding him all the information that got Oni to pin him as an any scapegoat and just completely destroy his life. And and she was ready to face the music. She was she was ready for Ben to just tear him to pieces. Granted, like there's a glass wall between the two of them, but she said that as, um, well, step back a little bit. So she asked for two-way transparency, and he's 
starts to to jabber on about he's not ready to present what he's written and she says ben he stops instantly turns and looks at her she says he didn't even remember him turning but as you would expect one that is as delusional as ben is you're like is this really this person so he he turns and looks at her dead eye contact and he slowly walks up to the glass and as she said as she was saying she was just ready for everything to just come undone all she could help but think to herself was this glass is awfully thin <laughs> but he responds in in the way that she doesn't expect she, he he i would say the way none of us expected no yeah definitely not at all she starts to apologize for what happened for what she did but ben is like you're alive you you didn't go on your suicide mission i i knew you'd find another way and as this is going as as he's saying this pharaoh's like wait doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know my my true identity. He still is like hopeful for her and and all the insurrectionists, despite the situation that he's in. And I mean that's that's some powerful stuff to go through all the stuff that that he's gone through and be like still have hope. I almost yeah, wonder if I, they were kind of using that to to you know to point to his mental state. It could I mean, be. I mean, granted, yeah, he probably does still believe it. But it kind of seems the way they structured it, it was kind of to point out that Ben is not entirely stable at the moment. Mm -hmm. That definitely comes across. And I was going to say, like, that moment when he they re, re, you know, sort of reveals that he doesn't know Pharaoh's true identity, I actually had to pause, was, you know, because I'm listening to this at work. And <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us were pretty much. Yeah, I think yeah. Most At least probably have day three jobs. times. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit the first time I uh, listened to it, it only took me forty minutes to get through this twenty-minute episode. <laughs> That's all. That's all. I was quite impressed. Usually, it's an hour and a half. <laughs> so whatever I do for these episodes is I listen to having just... a bad time at summer camp. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't consider this summer camp, but a lot, a lot more, uh, solid solitude, I think. So better than summer camp. <laughs> well, depending <laughs> on your preference. Sure. There's a lot of, uh, but yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of, of hinting at his mental state with the, where he currently is. And there's a lot that kind of evolves over her interaction with him during this, but it, there does seem to be a lot of points where he does seem lucid. He does seem together on certain parts, but then there are other parts where he does seem to be going crazy. Mm -hmm. So throughout this whole interaction, he's constantly like, it, it's a good thing you're alive. And, and he goes on to say, you, you, you shouldn't be here. They're constantly monitoring. And there's a couple of times where he's freaking out. He asked her to show her data pad up on the, the the window to make sure like the time hasn't changed so he doesn't know he's not dreaming so you get that sense of of he's kind of going crazy and he's mentally unstable in that regard but he remembers it's like he remembers all the stuff that he has done he remembers obviously pharaoh and like everything that he's been through so there are certain parts from where it's like he's like there there are parts where he's perfectly lucid and is like remembers, but then there are other parts where he he's just lost it because of solitary confinement just f's up your brain. Mm -hmm. And who else, who knows what else Oni has done? But yeah, to her surprise, he's happy to see her, and it's like she's just com completely blown away. Um, they they ask about how each other are, how each other are doing, and she says that he's that she's okay. And then she sees that there's there's blood on the her, on his bunk, and and she starts to be like, "Is this how they're treating you?" And and Ben's like, "No, no, 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 no. That was that was just me. It was it was rough at the beginning. Solitary confinement. Obviously, have read about it, but it's not as bad as it as it is, and wasn't ready. But but he admits that it was all him, and that he he's cool now. They they have procedures when he he goes crazy. He has music to calm him down." And if that doesn't help, they they just gas him. And and 
he's like he understands what's going on, but he's okay with it. That's a sign of a truly broken man. I mean, he even goes to the point to you know show her his hand. See, all better healed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was cut. I was I was bleeding from the hands, but it's fine now. It's everything's uh, fine. Just, as I'm going through this conversation, listening to this first, I'm getting chills. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is really kind of screwing with me. I'm like, what? Don't know what to expect next, of course, because I haven't heard it before. But just the depth of detail in what yeah. they're, what these two characters are saying and describing it just it really gave me chills oh yes well and mending mercy in the chat also says that the sound effects are just done so well that you could visualize being in the room at the same time and it's true oh, yeah. you have, it's like, you have somebody else is like being, brought up earlier it's like that little when she puts up the data pad the glass and you yeah. hear it's not too loud it's just subtle enough that you pick it up as you probably would Mm -hmm. it's like it's crazy how just in like engulfed you feel whenever you're listening to this and you have real emotional feelings tied to ben because we we journeyed with him through 13 episodes of season one and you like you were there along three and a half hours yeah after all is said and done but yeah like the the quality of this podcast is is put together so well it really is. And you do get to to see a lot of, of how Ben has been broken. But, I mean, despite his brokenness, it's still pretty impressive, all the stuff that he remembers of what has gone on while he was doing his investigation. That he still knows Pharaoh's there, and he still cares for Pharaoh enough to say, wait, you, sh- you shouldn't be here. They're, like, they're, they're monitoring everything. And he even goes to the point where he says, everyone knows I'm, I'm the bad guy, right? And at that point, you kind of know, okay, Oni's obviously worked some stuff to convince him that all the stuff that he, he did was, was wrong. So you know that there's definitely been some, some efforts by Oni to, to kind of break in and convert him. Well, and that's where she, she starts to lose it, too, when yeah. he makes that statement. Yeah. So there's... There's still a little back and forth, but basically at the near the very end of the conversation, he he basically says or is trying to make sure that every everyone's understands that he's the bad guy and, and she goes on to kind of reassure him, thinking that this is what he wants to hear, that people still want you free, Ben. Uh, like people actually care about you. You're you're a symbol of hope for people. And he's like, Well no 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 no, I I have this great idea. And he stutters a lot. He it's like he stuttered a lot in season one. Now he's really stuttering <laughs> so much. But he he's working on this basically this call for peace. Mm-hmm. Going through, I mean, that's obviously what he's been writing down on paper. And he, he starts to tell Pharaoh how he he's he has this this plan, and he's going to thank Pharaoh, but not directly, not not mention them. And, and she. She kind of gets reserved and is like, you should not really be thanking me. I didn't do what you think I did. And he goes on to say, no, 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 you, you really saved me. You saved me from the two people that were out there to kill me. You, you saved me from a whole bunch of harm. And she says that she killed two innocent people doing that. And he's like, no, 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 you, you were protecting me. I, I it was my fault that they came to try to kill me in the first place. It wasn't anything that you did. I was the one to blame. And then that when she that's when she crosses a line that she obviously should not have crossed and begins to say that they weren't going to the two guys in his apartment weren't going to kill him and in that instant Soli comes over the intercom and tells her to report to his office. I mean, it was a split second too. You could see where she was starting to say it and like there was no pause. Like Soli was obviously ready to intervene. And the first thing he does is announce that her name and her rank. Well, no, like he holds off a little bit. He gives her yeah, time to pretty, walk it's, away. It's but, pretty quick. Yeah. Well, yeah. When, like when he orders her to to go to his office, to report to the office. Um, 
Ben's obviously saying, run, run, tell her to run. And, and she's like, I, 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 I. and then Sully tells her to back away from the window. And like, she's still hesitating. And then that, like, it was three strikes you're out. So on that third strike, she said, he said, um, he said her name out loud as agent, mm-hmm. like an only agent. And that's like, she had two chances to get out with, without divulging any additional information. To, to like keep Ben still hopeful and still doing this whole peace thing. Now, obviously, Sully and the rest of Onia are trying to get him to do, and Sully has to pull the plug and says, "Agent Sankar, report to my office immediately. You no longer have um, clearance to see Ben." And that's when Ben starts to flip out. It's like, wait, 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 what, what, you're, you're, you're an Oni agent. You, you work for them. And she continues to stutter. Like she obviously has, she doesn't know what to say at all. She's completely taken aback and everything just kind of falls to pieces there. That whole scene after that, like when he starts (laughs) screaming at her, bashing on the glass and we get, you know, that, haunting image that was on top that was like the image for this episode ben with bloody smears on his gla- on the glass that just yeah and you could hear when when ben was starting to to go crazy music started playing in the background mm-hmm. to try to calm him down he said i mean ben mentioned earlier that whenever he gets uh gets a little out of control they play music so it's yeah, really evident that like it's it's something that's been under control for a while, and then she just kind of undid a lot of what they worked on. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think this is interesting because I'm sure you've seen this uh, that comment by Crash about what the music, like the the purpose of that or the parallel with that particular piece of music that's playing. Yeah, so I've like, had to talk and I can't it re- read it, it while it, I talk. So yeah, it's it, I'll no, I'll, re- I'll read it for you. It's when Beethoven began writing this particular piece of music that was playing. It was dedicated to Napoleon, who at the time was thought to be you know a man of the people and whatnot. That Napoleon declared himself emperor. Beethoven was furious. This and uh, kind of work. So you have this piece of music about someone who fooled everyone into thinking that he was fighting for the pop for the popular rebellion, but really he was just serving his own power. There you go. A little music lesson for you. It's it's pretty cool how some of the parallels and, and this is just kind of credit to to Noah and and Crash and all the guys that work on this. Th- th- it just shows how much effort they're putting into making this as epic a story as possible. And I have to give major kudos because this this is amazing. Like season one hooked me in. Season two is just like full steam ahead, taking basically the momentum that had they had in season one and, and carrying it on through. It's it's simply amazing. But it it was hard to see Ben just completely lose it. I mean, I would if I were in that situation too, I'd be like, wait, you're not who you say you are. I would go crazy. If you mm-hmm. were already going crazy, then there there'd be nothing stopping you from going even even more insane. And and that was that was heartbreaking because Maya in that moment had the power to just turn away and kind of let the status be let Ben have his glimmer of hope and like she I mean she said at the beginning when when she first walked up to the cell she was expecting to get ripped by Ben she expected that Ben knew what she did to get him where he was basically that she backstabbed him and she was ready to like get completely reamed for it but it's like so if if that wasn't the case if if wasn't that he knew your true identity. Why spill the beans? I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The, at the point where she realized that Ben didn't know that she betrayed him, that would have been the point to leave. And I don't know if it was her conscience that got her or just this overwhelming desire to help Ben as to why she stayed. I think she's just gotten too close throughout the five years that she's been working as Pharaoh. And you, later on, she, she kind of goes to say that she has developed a lot of friends while she's been Pharaoh and Ben was one of those friends. And I guess there's a point to where you feel that you should really tell someone the truth of what happened. But even still, it's like 
something that's been been worked on and like he still has that glimmer of hope which is good in some sense you know it's kind of only engineered at this point but why do you want to just completely destroy a man who's already been destroyed because it's fun <laughs> maybe for you i don't know i'm sure some i'm sure somebody <laughs> at oni would say it's just oh, that hurts it, that was like when that part came up and i was listening I, like i literally had to like pause the podcast i'm like what just happened because i mean you, you hear him banging on the grass on the glass you see him like like scraping down I, like there's a picture on hunt the truth on on the tumblr page and i'm assuming that's what that picture is 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 been continuing to like be on the glass and the blood smears is it from a, a time before when he was out of control that was that instant when he went crazy because she basically told him that she was a lie pharaoh was a lie this person that he had be- become to trust was was fake everything he worked for not to say that he was wrong like he he believes that what he did was wrong and seeing pharaoh we could only assume that <clears throat> once he was convinced that he was wrong that pharaoh wasn't going to do anything stupid and have hope for her that she would actually not get trapped and and have to go into the situation that he was in but now that he knows that she's an oni agent everything that he kind of was I mean, you would think basing his survival off of where him being in there, he was protecting his friends. And one of the last few friends he had wasn't a friend at all. It was a play. It was, it was complete fabrication. And that's devastating. Yeah, truly. So at that quiet note, we've just been informed that... Um, Keegan Michael Key's wife, right. Cynthia, is the voice of the AI at the Midnight, at Midnight Facility. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah, apparently. Uh, so hopefully, somebody from Halo PD is in the chat or listens to this at some write, point. Can write that down. Yeah, or copy yeah. paste the chat. Yeah. So that that's we're getting lots of little tidbits of of stuff in here. But yeah, that that's pretty cool. I mean, that just kind of goes to show that people are really interested in in this stuff. I mean, we talked about last week or on the last podcast last week how Mark Hamill was just interested in the story and wanted to be a part of it. And, the fact mm-hmm. that that Keegan was in the first season, and now his wife is a part of it, being the AI of Midnight Facility. That's that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So awesome. I just love that idea that it's like the husband is locked up and the wife is kind of his overseer. <laughs> the wife is his keeper. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty parallels. Yeah. That's that's a crazy coincidence. It's awesome, but still, just like wow, there's a lot of character development behind, like even just among. Because one of the things about voice acting that we we've, we've seen a couple like Vidox is there has to be good chemistry for characters to really work well together, and you hear mm-hmm. just like how uh, I don't know what the right word to use here is, but how like convincing the emotion is for Pharaoh or Maya in this case and Ben during this exchange where you genuinely have or get the sense that their emotions are real. Mm -hmm. That Ben is going crazy. That Ben is crushed whenever Maya spills the beans. And then you hear Maya sobbing and crying because she, she realized that she just, destroyed any image that Ben had of her or what Ben had of Pharaoh and someone that's been and she says this later on as a friend that she considers a friend destroying him in in that case she starts to to sob and, and cry this is an Oni agent who's supposed to be completely trained and being able to like go through some really hard stuff well you know Right after she started that, then she turned around and headed straight for uh, someone's office. Oh, yeah. So once... With the intention to dismember, I believe. <laughs> um, 
or it's something. in the subtext. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of between the lines. That wasn't actually yeah. in the, the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, just it's, a little bit. Right. It was probably it was probably on the script. It was probably on the script. It's like you're going in there to rip his head off. Well, he hadn't done anything wrong. I mean, I would assume that she knows that she violated He's some protocols. He's been a complete dick. That's in, that's enough to rip a person's head off. Yeah, but I mean, in this little exchange that we're getting here next, we kind of understand yeah, no. why he's being a big, yes. big dick. And that was like the, that for me was just one of the worst parts, like how, well, we'll get through it and then I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll expand on that. Right, right, right. There's, <laughs> well, no, there's definitely right a lot at this to, point, we're still looking at it from her point of view. We you haven't gotten to the next part, so right. I can see where she could be really irritated with Scully. Scully? Or not Scully. Sorry. <laughs> Sully. Sully. Right. right. But I just, sorry, X Files fans. No, sorry. Oh, I was gonna I was gonna say Marble Hornets, but <laughs> Yeah. But I just kinda want to reiterate and, and reflect on this last piece because it is so emotionally convicting on how they presented it. I cannot give enough props to Noah and Ian and all the other guys that have worked behind Hunt the Truth and the voice actors in here because that the pre- the presentation in just that segment it pulls out emotions it, it and it's presented so well like I I, I was mm-hmm. I mean that's one of the reasons why I had to pause I'm like wow I have I have to take a minute to to actually process this I mean I'm guessing you guys probably had to like pause or rewind at the very end of that too <laughs> oh I've pretty much spent the entire evening from the time I've got home till the time we started the podcast, re-listening to it just over and over again. But yeah, yeah, there were several moments in there where you hear it and you're like, what? <laughs> you know, rewind, <laughs> re-listen. Did I hear that right? Yeah. One thing I wanted to bring up that I underlined and, and th- this is kind of a, a big point And I think this kind of reiterates or, or will be kind of the foundation of some of the stuff that we'll see throughout season two is we go back and see like the whole psychological paranoia stuff and Ben asking pet or uh, uh, not Petra um, Maya to put up her data pad to check the time to make sure that he's not dreaming to make sure that what he was like seeing her was real and, and not just a dream. And she points out that, What's real and what is not real. That was Ben's whole purpose of doing his hunt the truth piece. And like trying to uncover that for all the Oni lies and all the Oni secrets. Trying to dig up all the stuff that the government had buried. That was his purpose for like the last few months. And Ben firmly believed that people deserve to know. And now he's been whittled down such to the point where he's looking for just basic human truth. What is real and what's not real from Mm -hmm. like just what he's experiencing with his like paranoia and dreaming and, and what's actually real. So we go from like trying to uncover government lies and conspiracies and secrets, this big grand scale and then we scale it down to the smallest shred of trying to figure out basic human truth. I thought that just kind of just put it in perspective on how Ben's life had drastically transformed from season one and Hunt the Truth, where he was trying to uncover all this stuff. And now we just see him at, at, the, at the lowest of low that a human being could possibly be. And that struck me. That really, it's like, wow, that's some profound stuff right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine just like you go on your day to day activities, like, you know what, what's going on and to, to be in Ben's shoes and, and like, you have to question everything of whether or not it's actually real. I mean, that's sad. That's hard to hear. And it's, it it's was terrible. It's it terrifying. Was presented so well where it's just like, wow, you cannot help but not stop and think about that reality like how how would you handle it like you, how, how do you just like listen listen the way it was presented you 
I would be surprised if you just couldn't go through it and, and, and not stop to think about the implications of that. That I, Maybe that's just me, but that was one of the most profound parts of, of that bit that I, that I found. Just kind of the grandiose scale of trying to figure out what was real and what wasn't real from a galactic standpoint and then completely reducing that down to what was real and what wasn't real just for himself. Yeah, I think I'm still processing on that one. I can tell because there's a lot of silence right now. <laughs> so we'll move on. It's a lot to take in. Right. Yeah, just totally broken. Yeah, which is sad. You've been talking to Receptor too much. I Mind have? blown. <laughs> uh, there's probably going to be a lot more minds blown throughout this season. I will tell you that much. So after we have the whole bin breaking down and the music's playing and they finally have to sedate them. <laughs> Once the glass goes opaque, she pulls herself together and makes a beeline to Sully's office. And when she gets there, uh, Sully asks her to sit, and then she's like, I prefer to stand. And, and then he says, no, I, I insist. So there's already Have a, a bunch of tension. Right over there. There, there's already a bunch of tension between both of them. Obviously, he's kind of peeved that she just went in and started undoing a lot of the progress that he's made. And then she's obviously pissed off because of the situation that she has seen Ben in. So they're both on edge as it is. And he goes on to, to kind of explain to him that before he was in, in this state, like this calm state where he was in, he was going crazy. He was, I mean, the whole blood on the bed thing. I mean, Ben wasn't, lying when he was trying to hurt himself and and caused all that sully said that there was points where he was constantly rubbing his head against walls and basically rubbing his scalp raw which that's a graphic detail and of its own <laughs> mm -hmm. and he had to basically go there and he enacted new protocols which ben eventually calmed down from hurting himself from punching walls to, to rubbing his scalp raw and like until he got there it was just it was bad so he enacted new protocols to where he would play music to help calm him down and if that didn't work they would, they would gas the chamber and it all matched up with what Ben was saying and, and Ben had come to just accept all that which you kind of know okay this he's gone crazy he's now accepting all of all of everything and until Maya went to go see him, there wasn't an incident for a while. He was com he was fine. He was writing on his paper. He was he was doing okay. And then when she started to spill the beans on on the the truth behind a lot of the stuff, he fell apart. And that was the first time that they had to use the music or the gas in a long time. And he felt that she was ruining all the progress that he made when he came and put those new protocols into effect to help him. And then she was just completely undoing it. So of course he's on edge. And then she is just completely livid on the fact that he has been psychologically like tormented and, and they're, they're breaking him for, for their own purposes. I mean, it's only, why wouldn't they? Right. Well, yeah, they're, basically brainwashing him to be a champion of their cause. Right. To go out in public and say, I was wrong. Well, and he mentioned to try that to he was offset what he'd already put out there. Right. And he was mentioning how he was writing a piece that would basically call for peace and admitting that he was wrong and, and trying to get the colonies to, to cooperate with Oni and that Oni would be cooperating with them. So yeah, there's obviously hidden agendas in here. But she called Sully out on the, they're working him as a, a PR asset mm -hmm. to make a video message for all the, the free Duro crowd out in the other colonies. And I mean, she, she points out blatantly that. So you're basically breaking him to like parade him for your own purposes. And Sully's like, well, if it's to resolve civil unrest, then yeah, <laughs> pretty much. If that's what you mean by parading him is, is using him to kind of address the situation that we're trying to, to fix, then then yeah, caught red handed. And she 
obviously is not very fond of that response because she feels that they're they're still trying to squeeze a lot out of him where he's he's already they've already gotten so much out of him and she doesn't feel that the way they're going about this is going to appeal to the sympathizers for Jero. And obviously being in, in backwash and, and we kind of see a parallel here to, to Ben because whenever Ben went to earth, when he was called by Sully to, to go to Oni, uh, Petra made a, a very good observation that he had been out in the field way too long. He, he was not on top of his game. He wasn't sharp. He, like, he, he wasn't up to snuff. And Sully kind of says the same thing about Maya, where he, she's been out in the other colonies for, for five years. And like, there, there's a reason why they didn't consult her whenever they decided to go with this plan for, for Ben, for making him a, a PR asset, because she had been so close to her mission. Because she'd target. been pissing in swamps for, fa- for five years. Right. Mm-hmm. Just the way he said he like basically dismisses her is. I mean, he has a point. Uh, arrogant. That's a valid point. I mean, he does, but he does it in such a way that it seems like he revels in like he's, it's like he's given her the middle finger and enjoying every second of it. The way I felt, mm-hmm. the way he delivered that. There's there's a very interesting dichotomy to Sully because as we'll continue to see here as we go on. There's parts of it where you definitely feel the the high and mighty Oni side of things, but you also see that Sully does have a human side. He do, he mm-hmm. does have a side that does care, just not as prevalent as the other side. <laughs> but well, you know, as he says, he gave Ben multiple opportunities to let it be and to walk away from it. Right. And by the end, he basically said, "Drop it now." Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, no subtlety, no Oni double speak. Just drop it. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of stuff that kind of goes to that as well. And it's, I think we, I don't know if we'll see this throughout the rest of season two, but we're obviously jumping ahead here a little bit. But if we're going to assume that everything that's gone on was intentionally set up by Honey, the, the fact of Pharaoh trying to reach out to him and and all that stuff, then Oni has a direct or uh, and I, I haven't had too much time to think of this, but Oni does have kind of a, a cause behind him being there. Now whether it's like Pharaoh or, or Maya in this case pushing him too far or if it was just because of all the Oni secrets and and Ben's stubbornness that he got there. I think that's something that we'll we may discover throughout the rest of it. I think we all have kind of our own opinions on that, but it's definitely one of those things that it's hard to to pin the scapegoat here. But I mean, everything at, at some point Oni I think is to blame for where Ben is right now. Because I mean, he oh, oh, of course they oh, are. absolutely yeah. Is the the way like I I brought this up in my breakdown. It's you know how much because we we've seen before Oni like they're they they have all these different divisions and we've seen they operate differently they don't they aren't always aware of what everyone every other division is doing so I mean I think it started out where Section Two Sully's division was genuinely trying to get this this profile of the chief out and then Section Three saw been doing some shit and kind of got in there and mucked with section two's plans and ideas. And, you know, just the way uh, Sully describes, it's like, you know, when he talked about how, how badly Ben was being treated or how much he was being neglected when, before Sully arrived, it seems like, you know, they're just kind of trying to clean up a mess that they kind that they created. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, somewhat mostly unintentionally. Right. Well, and we have the whole thing of glass plants have bad records excuse. That was this I just love that. Yeah, we'll get it's to like, that. In I a gave second. him every war I gave him every warning. Oh yes, glass planets have bad records. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that here in a second. But it, at at some point you have to really kind of consider Ben doing his pro and I, I think we kind of all agree that Ben didn't really start posting the episodes probably until like maybe episode three or four. It was actually it was after episode six because that's the one where 
He what? That's the one where he's like he meets uh, the one the one voice actor on the plane, and then he gets knocked out by Oni, and he. They yeah, that's when he drag, decides yeah. to start doing the podcast. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's so right. it was like episode six was the, or it was right after, you know, the events of episode six that he posted that primer and put up those first six episodes. But Mashak was reaching out to him very early on, and that was yeah. definitely one of those variables that. I think Oni was completely blindsided by. Probably. That along with the other contacts that he had in the other colonies while he was out there. It's, I mean, Oni probably had the best intentions to not let it get that out of control. But like Petra said, when he was going to visit Oni in Boston, of course they were not expecting him to have those assets. To them, it's supposed to be an easy job just to kind of get Ben back into the field. I mean, there's there's a lot of, strangely, a lot of resolution in season two so far, just from the pilot and this first episode that tie back into season one. And there's lots of really cool references too. Like I, I'm like even just as we're talking through it, I'm seeing tie-ins with with season one. I'm like, wow, I didn't really know that. And there there's quite a few interesting parallels too. I don't know if that's intentional. Uh, I don't know if Ian and Noah want to like say if those are intentional or not but it's it's a really cool storytelling mechanism to tie that back into to some of the stuff that we've already seen and then see see how it plays out here with maya and pharaoh and and just see some of the similarities because i think it's pretty safe to assume that by this time maya has obviously gone rogue which is why these podcasts are coming out so while Ben wasn't exactly go like had the intent of going rogue. He was like out there to to search for the truth, and then just kind of converted and, and went crazy. Whereas for Maya, we have a more intentional. Okay, I I actually know this stuff, but because of some of the stuff that happens, I can't be quiet anymore. And seeing a lot of the same similarities between her being out and the and the field for five years getting way too close to to them uh and then we had ben who was out in the other colonies for a long time as well not being up to snuff for the the job that he was actually given it was it was supposed to be an easy job but it wasn't i I think i think there are some pretty interesting similarities not they're not completely like similar characters but there are some pretty interesting tiebacks to season one well what i've gotten from you know, just these first two episodes, it almost, I mean, it, it looks like that it, yes, it did start out to be just a fluff piece to, you know, make master chief look good, but somewhere along the line, section three sounds like they started manipulating what Ben found out. Cause you got to remember Maya has been under for five years. It is entirely possible. She knew Mishak. You can't, uh, I, to be in that side of it and not run across a truther in that time frame, somebody that is working against the same people you are, it just it would it just strikes me as a little odd that she wouldn't have run across him. I actually I agree because like I was thinking when we found out that Farrell was an Oni agent, I have to wonder if it kind of might actually explain uh, Petrovsky's actions at the end of season one. Where, you mm-hmm. know, he goes on the show and he suddenly, um, yeah, by the way, I was faking it. I was lying to Ben or whatever. Because we know that, you know, even though it was Mashak that introduced Ben to Petrovsky, he was to say that Petrovsky wasn't introduced to Mashak by Pharaoh. And it's been this kind of long game to a degree. Yeah, it's, I'm not saying they planned to set Ben up the way they did originally. I they did, but... but I think they saw an opportunity to cover something else up with this event. Yeah, probably. But there's just so much out there that while Ben was doing this story is like, it just got out of control and crashing here saying, don't forget about Biko. That was something that completely just fed the, and and that's, that's a weird thing too. Cause like if Pharaoh's the one that leaked all the Biko stuff, and she's working with Oni, then like what advantage does that have to keeping Oni in the power play position? 
It's only. I can't it can think a, like them. It could work I'm a lot. It could work, work a lot of ways because, the, like, especially once you get towards the end of the season, you know, the UEG has kind of cut out the outer outer colonies. That really does give Oni free reign to kind of go in, sweep through, do so, you know, do some stuff they might not normally be able to get away with, um, and you know, with. Or that there you go. They you know get they can sweep through and maybe take out some radicals they might nor- not normally be able to without somebody seeing them or somebody saying something to the galaxy at large. Yeah, there's a thousand ways that you know creating un- instabil- temporary instability could work in Oni's favor for in- for stability in the long run. Mm-hmm. I guess she did say that in season one, didn't she? A little. I don't know if she said it. That's just kind of what what went through my mind when, especially like it's, it, it brought it back up once we learned what uh, Pharaoh's mission out in the colonies was. But um, it's kind of the stuff that went through my mind when uh, I was thinking, like, okay, why would all this happen? And, you know, it's just some stuff that went through my head. Oh, there's a lot of stuff to think about. Like I said, there's a lot of resolution from season one, but there's probably a handful of more questions that are coming up now too because we learned that Pharaoh <laughs> yeah. is an Oni agent you, get, yeah. you have to kind of go back and, and rethink of everything that happened in season one now and the motivation behind certain things And I, to be honest I haven't even really thought about doing that until now where you're going back through all the season one stuff I guess starting basically from episode Seven just watched eight. the supercut three and a half hours. <laughs> well, but, no, I actually that's one of the things I plan on doing this weekend is re listening to it and seeing how these first two episodes affect my views on the stuff in season one. How does this really you we know, we've seen the points where they it obviously ties together, but to see if there's anything else in there that's not quite so obvious where it ties together. Like, okay, well, that didn't make sense the first time through, but now it does. Or even just, oh, God, there's this layer I never even thought about. Uh Uh-huh. That type of stuff. Like, again, I hate to keep plugging myself, but my own breakdown of this, I said at the very end, it's like, I can't imagine knowing now that Pharaoh is an Oni agent going back and re-listening to season one. It'd be just this whole different experience. Oh, in definitely. So ways. I think we almost have to now because it's yeah. it's basically enlightening is what like, it is. I think like cause when that final episode comes out, I might just have to take a day and listen to all of Hunt the Truth from episode one to season two, episode whatever the final one is. Oh, yeah. And just <laughs> let your mind be blown over and over. Yeah, it's got me really pumped to see where this goes. I'm excited. I I am really because it's already made a U turn and a loop to loop. It's made several of those, and it's hard to and keep track of them all too. No kidding. Oh gosh, and and we have another. And the sad part is, we're only halfway through the episode. I know. I'm not even off of my first page of notes. I have two full pages of notes. Oh, well, I'm at the I'm at the very bottom of my first page. But, anyways, getting back on topic with the podcast though, uh, we we just wrapped up with. Um, how they didn't consult Maya on what to do with Ben and Sully makes the comment about living in the swamp for five years and how he would more choose to go with what command says. And she basically calls him out and saying that, well, you, while you're in your glass tower in Boston, you have no idea what's, what's really going on on the ground. And he says he basically tries to defend himself, saying, I, "I've heard the chatter. I, I hear all the progress you're you're trying to make on steering the other colonists away from conflict, but um, at in the at the end of the day, the stuff that you're doing isn't going to necessarily um, end the rebellion, so to speak." He, he says, "Unless your coalitions of coalition of hugs can end the rebellion, then there's there's just going to have to be unfortunate casualties that." Uh, behind actually trying to find peace to this. And Maya is like, is, is torturing Ben who, who is an innocent civilian. Is that part of the answer? And th- this is kind of where 
I think a lot of people say Sully is an absolute a hole. Uh, ben says, or uh, um, Sully says, Ben forfeited his innocence when he tried to tear Oni down, mm-hmm. given that he had like they tried to give him plenty of warning to to not go down the path. And this is the whole part where uh, Maya is like, glass plants have bad rec- records, really. That's the best you can do on trying to steer him away. And then Scully, uh, Sully turns that around on her and basically says, well, you're out in the field. You have a lot more freedom to adjust your orders than I do when I'm set, you know, basically sitting here right underneath the brass's nose. Mm-hmm. Constantly under surveillance, have pretty much no freedom mm-hmm. to, to stray away from doing anything. And that that's kind of the part where she admits, yeah, he kind of has a point. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a good excuse, but it, it is something where when you're being overseen and under that much scrutiny, you don't have that much wiggle room to to kind of help. And I mean, we, we saw Soli really, really give him the last chance when he was at the headquarters. He's like, you don't have time. You have a deadline and the flight for the 530. Okay. I mean, that, at that point, judging on what we're hearing now, he was genuinely trying to give him an out of letting him mm-hmm. like get out of this scot-free. And then Mashak went and tore everything up, getting the um, the flight no cross protocol all in a tizzy. Yeah, it's yeah, like like he said, he gave Ben several opportunities to just walk away, or at least to, fall in line. Yeah, well, either way, to to drop yeah. the story he was pursuing and do the story they wanted him to. And there's that point where. I mean, even after he started releasing the podcasts, he got a few more chances just to let it go. Yeah. It wasn't until he addressed the UEG where Sully said, you're done. Right. And at that point, it was over. Ben was now the number one priority for Oni. And they start cooking up all this stuff to frame Ben. Well, and as uh, as Sully put it, they couldn't just let him expose all the secrets. And because, mm-hmm. I mean, to his point, the public doesn't manage panic and horror well at all. No. And and having all that out there, I mean, he says, like, positive change and open dialogue that Ben was trying to promote. No, that that would not help the situation at all. It's like well, that classic a, line from the original Men in Black. It's like, a person is smart. People are stupid. They panic. They run. They Yeah, that's what I was just getting ready to say. <laughs> Great minds you know, think alike. Yeah. yeah, and it's true. And you can just look at any crowd, even in our system, anywhere, anywhere in our world. Or Black Friday. <laughs> that's a totally different nuts. But anyway... <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't yeah. help it. talking about crowds. You can talk to a person about these politically charged arguments, okay? You cannot talk to a crowd without coming almost to, to blows. Yeah. And the more people in the crowd, the faster it, it accelerates to that. So I can see where having this information out there, yes, it is very damaging, and it wouldn't be something that would be just openly discussed over a spot of tea. There would be fights about this. And it, it, it was almost enough to start a civil war. Mm-hmm. But I think Oni, like you said earlier, with, o- with Ben digging around in this stuff, I think Oni saw an opportunity to do something. I don't know what it is. You know, speaking of which, I just have to... Because Crash just posted this yeah, in the chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading it. <laughs> yeah. Ben was addressing the UEG. Who patched him in again? So Pharaoh patched him in, and Sully was there. It was almost like that was a damage assessment mm-hmm. on how bad it actually looked out there. Like, what secrets were actually exposed. Which will explain why when 
Pharaoh came back and said it didn't have the impact that we wanted. That was a cover up for, and basically the whole thing of them getting together was we need to see how bad this actually is out there. And again, I have not gone back and re-listened to any of season one after listening to these two episodes, because honestly that would take a lot of time, but it's, you, you, there's a lot of tie back between season Mm -hmm. one and and all this. It's, Oh my gosh, my, my head's going to (laughs) explode. So yeah, it's like, it's damage control. They're, they're trying to see how much is, is out there. And I mean, Ben's obviously doing these podcasts and, Sorry, my, my head is, is trying to process it all while we're doing it. It just, I can't multitask like that. So if anyone else wants to interpret my thoughts. Brain fried. I know. I, it's like, I need a few days to to, to digest all of this. Process, yeah. This is a heavy meal. Well, <laughs> I like Crash's little response there. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, oh my gosh. And the last thing I will say about it. Uh, yeah, we'll wait for that one a second. But to, and to go back to... Uh, something else that we skipped over uh, when Soli was saying that Ben uh, forfeited his innocence when he tried to tear Oni down is that Maya said, maybe we should be torn down. And Soli's like spoken like a true traitor. Mm-hmm. And uh, to a point he's, he's right. And I think that's kind of, if we didn't have indications already from just the fact that this is a podcast and we know that she's pretty much gone rogue at this point. That's definitely one of those points where it's like, if you're starting to have second guesses about the organization you're working with, that's a tell sign, especially for an organization like Oni. I'm sure Soli made a note of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and he threatened to tell um, the rear admiral whenever he like reports up to, to Boston. It's like, what should I say whenever I tell the rear admiral that we had... An unauthorized visit to the um, most secretly held federal prisoner and di- divulging federal secrets. And, and she's just silent. She's like, y- you can hear in the back of her head, he's like, you would dare. And there's a lot going on. And, and through this, you see a little bit of Sully's humanity, but you also see the big play where it's like, he, he is definitely for the only position, but he he does kind of care what happens to people he just sees it kind of as well that's the unfortunate situation Uh, i i gave ben plenty of opportunities to turn he didn't take them yeah i feel bad but that's what the situation is where we're seeing maya her emotions are definitely playing more into her reaction being around people that are definitely a lot more emotional a lot more vocal a lot more angry and intense with their feeling feelings towards Oni and the UEG. So I mean, she has to be visibly emotional and into that kind of stuff. So you, you expect that would play a part into it. So we actually have a question in chat real quick, which I'm going to answer uh, from uh, Tyraniac. He says, I'm a bit confused about what season two actually is in universe. Season one is obviously Ben's podcast, but what is season two? Was my recording her visit to midnight or should we think, it more of an audio drama that doesn't exist in universe. I, this is definitely um, an afterthought. It does exist in universe. It does exist in universe, yeah. but this is something that she has compiled after the fact. I'll, there, there is one thing that I've thought about, which I can't really quite place, but it unless she had the intention of like this, this is part of her just routine documentation and follow up for her job as Pharaoh why was she recording all these different audio bits? Cause obviously she's making these podcasts after all these events have happened. It's, it's told in such a way that she's gone through these experiences. And now after everything is said and done, now she's making these podcasts similar to what Ben did for episodes one through five of season one. Yeah. The way I kind of see it at this point is that she's kind of gotten, you know, out in the field, she's gotten used to maybe just recording things like the way she is. Uh, just recording this background chatter for whatever reason it might be. And she's just kind of right now. She might just be doing it out of habit. Well, go back to the pilot episode real quick, because the audio bits from the troopers, that would be Oni recordings. That wouldn't necessarily be her recordings. 
Actually, yeah, you're tr- you're right about that. So, I mean, my guess is that so at least the stuff from the, the stuff from episode two, I think, might be that. But it's possible too because we we keep talking about her going rogue. You know, she and she obviously does have some hacking skills, so maybe. But you didn't install the. <laughs> well, you could think that as part of her thing that she needed to have for Pharaoh, she like she could justify needing certain files. And then before going rogue, you you download all the files that you need. Make sure you have everything and then go off the grid while you like yeah. while you have access yeah, that's, that's to everything you need. And then when you're ready to actually hit the street or completely just go off the grid, then that's when you like once you have everything that you think you need before risking losing access because you are going off the grid. And, and she would have that kind of access. I mean, she had access clearly to go visit cell Bravo 349 and see Ben. And someone mentioned in the chat earlier, it's pretty odd that Sully would allow her to go down there. And it, it, I don't think he was expecting her to. She used her clearance with the base AI to go down to see Ben. And it was unauthorized. Granted, the AI probably told Sully that Ben was getting a visitor, but she had clearance, so the AI wasn't going to stop her. Well, I'm sure the AI told uh, told him as soon as she said she was going where she was going. Oh yeah, what was going on? Oh yeah. So it's, it's and he probably was just listening in, just as well. You know, he was to see her state. Well, for him to react, I mean, just to see her state state of mind and to you know, interrupt her if she started doing something she shouldn't. Which he did, or saying something she shouldn't. It was definitely evident. By how quickly he reacted that he was listening in the whole time mm-hmm. and he, he gave her the, the time to to let it play out granted she probably would have gotten reamed still from from Sully. it's like why did you go see my prisoner but it wouldn't have been as, as bad and, and vocal as it turned out to be but we, we do see her starting to really question some of the intent and I, th- I think to to the credit of Ben, it is really something where it's the perspective of how Oni and the UEG have treated the outer colonies. And to be honest, it looks like it's starting to seep in on her. The ODST from the last episode mm-hmm. had a very good point. It's like, maybe you've been out here with these innies way too long. And of course, she, she shoots him a, a, a dirty comment back, but he has a point. Just saying. All right. So moving on, we let's see where we, we talked about the glass planet. We talked about the maybe should turn down. Um, let's see. Uh, so Soli makes a really interesting comment about like, have you ever seen people tear each other to pieces trying to get on an evac ship? And, and she shoots back. Yes, I've actually seen it close up in person. And, and Soli Soli uses that to basically say that um, while you have one perspective. I am privy to certain uh, data that gives me a more overall picture of what's going on that if you understood, you wouldn't be touting the things you were saying and you would actually know why we're doing some of the things we're doing. And right there, if anyone's ever moderated a forum, you know exactly what (laughs) Sully feels. (laughs) Right. Uh, Well, there's proper, you know, on both sides of this, there's a propaganda machine. Oh yes, absolutely. the The whole conversation between Sully and and Pharaoh, or Sully and Maya, I keep wanting to call her Pharaoh, but um, they're interchangeable at this point. I it's think it's amazing <laughs> how like they're both right and they're both wrong at the same time, and say like, it's like I'm right about this, but shit, he's right about that. And where does it go? It's these well, opposing was... ideas. That's so much gray. There's no black and white at all. Mm-hmm. I was speaking more towards the the whole side of the any and Audi argument. Why are we talking about belly and buttons? It was yeah, <laughs> <I'm> belly kidding. buttons. <laughs> I That's the key to the Halo universe: belly buttons. They're not belly Halo buttons. rings; they're belly buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sorry. Giant belly buttons. Sorry, just random tangent. <laughs> have to have at least one. But it was pointed to you. Where I well, I've gotten this from a lot of sources, but where it was most prevalent was in the book New Blood. Oh, New Blood. 
where uh, Buck is talking with the insurrectionist leader on his own planet, Draco, where she's spouting all this utter bull, and Buck knows it because Buck was there. Right. Yeah. But it's just like. I was born here, like five miles down the street. But my point is, is that the point of view can skew how you see the side of an argument. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And, and to your point, there are valid points on, on both sides of, of this disagreement where there's definitely some things that Maya has seen being out in the outer colonies and amongst the insurrectionists and there's stuff that Sully is seeing. So there's two very different points of view, but it's not to say that one isn't right over the other. I mean, that's, that's kind of the whole thing here. That's, that's the whole theme that we're seeing. It's like, who's right and who's wrong. It's, it's, it's definitely not it's the civil, well, you know, down with government type of stuff, but, but they have, I mean, Obviously, they don't want the conflict. Granted, I think there's definitely a lot of ulterior motives there with wanting peace. And if we go back to, like, so for the pilot episode, we heard Pharaoh talking about or talking to the uh, the innies that they need to to build up and actually be able to have their own resources and have something that they could actually bargain with with the UEG. But then if you go back to season one where Ben was basically saying that the inner colonies basically came to raid all the resources and, and they pulled out when they had no use for them anymore. Well, it's kind of like that vicious cycle again. You want to build up the other colonies and make it to where, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with you. You, you. We can see some benefit there. Strip them all of it and pull out again. At least that's what I envision would make, or that that's kind of one of the, the ulterior motives that Oni would have. Maybe I'm looking it in too much, but kind of makes sense yeah i just yeah these kind of arguments are they can go in so many different directions it it can make your mind hurt yeah but you know you basically got the point that i was looking at that you know, each each one of them is looking at the same argument from same argument from a different point of view yes very much so but i just kind of the way Sully is acting. He, it does seem, and don't get me wrong, he's been an asshole. <laughs> it does seem that he is at least trying to look at it from the other side. At least he seems to be a little bit more receptive to it. Well, and like he said, there's only so much that he can do being in the glass tower that is only headquarters in Boston. He only has so much wiggle room for him to actually be effective or be a little more lenient. I mean, he he basically couldn't tell Ben, hey, you need to stop this because if you go down this path, this is what's going to happen. He couldn't tell him that. That's classified information. So for the, I mean, yeah, there there is a side of Sully that that does kind of carry it, but He's more the type of person to just throw stuff to the wayside. It's like, well, I gave you a chance and, and you're there, you're gone. Whereas we have a lot of other characters and we, we see Maya kind of filling that role where something happens to someone you really care about. You, you're going to want some blood. You're going to want some revenge. I don't think Sully feels that way about Ben. I don't know if Sully feels that way. I mean, I, I'm sure he feels bad, but... It wasn't something where Ben was like a close friend. Whereas for Maya, who was Pharaoh, who has had to have those close relationships with people who's, I mean, it's hard to not build those relationships without actually having those genuine relationships. So having that relationship with all the other people that she's been around and then having that relationship with Ben, the emotional side of you actually gets attached. And when something bad happens, you want to, rectify you want to have justice for it and i think that's where we're starting to see that element of maya not really being the one that exists anymore i mean there, there was a profound statement at the end of episode one what does maya think of all this because she's been living as pharaoh for so long 
that she doesn't even really know what Maya thinks anymore. And I think that really plays out here because her response to her seeing Ben in the situation that he's in, the state that he's in physically, mentally, and her reactions to Sully, it's very indicative of her Pharaoh aspect and not her Oni agent Maya aspect. I think that's very indicative of the type of character that we're dealing with and the reason why she has gone rogue. Did I just blow people's brains? <laughs> there, there's awkward silence. <laughs> yeah. I think the time is starting to wear then on don't us. Don't stop talking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> stop okay, it. fine. Don't stop I'll, I'll keep talking, guys. Stop stopping. Stop stopping. <laughs> okay. I think basically we're all saying pretty much the same thing when it comes to Maya. Right. Yeah. She's trying to figure out who she is. Oh, she... What she really believes. Right. And she has lived with the any so long that she's obviously picked up on some of the reasons that they're fighting for what they believe in. And she she she's in the best position to understand both sides of the coin. But she's been with one side of the coin for so long that that side is, is the more prevalent side. And I think that's what's really showing here. It's, it's, you can't really be balanced between both sides. You, you basically have to be one side or the other. There's, it's almost impossible to play the middle ground. At least that's the way it, it seems. If we go back to the podcast, we, after Soli says his little bit about not really having the whole picture that he does, he kind of expands on that and says that, if there was any part of that story that really made it out to the masses and had the effect that it was going to have, if, if, if it stopped trade for a month, just the whole system would have collapsed. And this is where Maya said that admittedly Sully was right on all of these different points, because if, if the, the panic had ensued of everything coming out of, of what been had and if like the the truth was made out as the big only secret instead of him being put away then there was going to be all out devastation and panic is something that wreaks havoc even in tense situations and there have been as many people lost to just overall panic and the tensions between the UEG and the other colonies as there were losses from just the covenant alone and all the secrets that Ben had uncovered, that was basically a, a panic bomb that would have gone off and, and destroyed a lot of infrastructure. And just even even with how unstable the current relationship is with the inner and outer colonies, it, it would have made things much, much worse if a lot of that information got out. And after which, you know, leans to how they went uh, went to to such great detail to cover it up. Right after that part, this is where they they kind of have their little tit for tat, and Sully basically says, "I'm supposed to be here," and he he goes through the whole part that we mentioned earlier of, "Well, what should I tell the rear admiral when I report this up?" And ha- basically has kind of that silent, it's like you you better watch what you're doing, and he he finally says, "Stay away from my prisoner." And that's a warning, and. Maya responds back, stay away from me. And that's a threat. And finally, um, someone comes in and, and basically says that um, Captain Ryback is, is ready to, to see her. And at that point, she starts to, to leave. And Sully says, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what this means. Um, I will come back around for you, Maya. I promise. Like, I don't know if that means that you will get your resolution on all this stuff or like playing a card that he played similar with Ben was where it's like all this stuff that, that you've done, there will be, it will have a justification in the end type of thing. Like I'm not sure exactly what that phrase particularly means. What, what, what's your guys take on that? I guess I really hadn't thought about it. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the other big point other than the, the one where it was Maya saying, how Ben was reduced from trying to figure out what's real and what's not real in, in the galactic scale to what's real, what's not real from just his own humanity standpoint. This is the other big thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, what does Sully mean by 
everything will come back around for you. That's not the exact quote, but it's along those lines. I mean, it was something to the point where like she was already like enraged in the whole conversation, but it, it, it's like she said that her, her blood was on fire mm-hmm. after that, that whole back and forth. So I don't know that that's one of those phrases where it's like, I don't know how to interpret that line. Yeah, just wait till the end of the season and it all becomes. <laughs> but I don't want to wait till the end of the season. I want to know now. Tell me now, please. Noah, Ian, hence. All then go into Bones. Seattle, break into 343 yeah, and steal the script. <laughs> it's only 120 it pages. It won't, <laughs> won't take you quite as long as his as last light. Oh, gosh. I don't know. So that, that's, that was kind of the big part of this. And then we enter into... I think what's going to really lay the foundations for all the stuff that we'll see in Halo 5. And this has all the relationships to all the little videos that we've been seeing over the last week and a half, two weeks, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's like a week and a half about now. You're right. So she's in with uh, Captain Noah Ryback. This is the same person that called in on the radio when she first got extracted. Which, incidentally, I think a lot of people seem to agree that he's played by Alan Tudyk, so any any theory for Mickey showing up is pretty much out the door at this point. Just putting that out there. Okay. And she mentions that Noah was actually one of her instructors whenever she was being trained in Oni, and he'd always looked out for her. And at, at the point that she obviously was exhausted from the little conversation that she had with Sully, so she asks Noah to make this debrief really quick. And that's when he tells her that this isn't a debrief about the Jiro mission. This actually has nothing to do with the Jiro mission. And she's like, wait, wait, what? Then then what is this for? And this is where Noah brings up that they received disturbing transmissions and uh, footage from the region with that is showing mass destruction on various planets seismic eruptions, buildings exploding, cities being completely leveled, just monumental destruction. And this is where the video clips that we've been seeing play into to hunt the truth. So all the little video clips we're, we're seeing are like body cams, helmet cams of people from these affected worlds. Well, Meridian. They all, Sorry, that's, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Say so, yeah, because they all do. Say yeah, Meridian. they all do say Meridian, and they're all most likely either militia or UNSC personnel because they all have. Uh, well, they all have the UNSC. At least I believe they all have a I have a rank on there, and like UNSC, I'd have to go double check, but I think they all do. Well, I thought I, I thought one or two of the stationary ones were like you know street cams or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they could be. It's it's problem. It's I haven't looked at too much. I don't. You know, they they the they're so long yeah. that you catch so much detail. Right. But yeah, I going back to that, yes, you can definitely see the tie in to Halo Five. And it's interesting to find out why they really called her to Midnight Facility. Right. Well, and we forgot to mention this at the very beginning too. But yeah, the reason why she went to Midnight is because no one could know her cover. Absolutely no one. And Midnight was a top secret enough facility that there really wouldn't be anyone there, even with an Oni, that wouldn't know about this mission. And it, I mean, that when it's something where you can't even tell other Oni agents what you're doing, that's a pretty serious op. When it comes to Oni, there's only one person that really knows what's going on. Margaret and- Perengoski. Well, <laughs> Osmond now. Nah, Perengoski still knows more. She's se- she's still the secret head of Oni. I guarantee it. <laughs> nah, but but anyway. So all the little video clips, that's kind of what we assume is being shown to Maya at this point. Mila goes on to say that search and rescue was scrambled, but by the time they were able to get there, there was just total devastation. And she asks him, do we know what it is? He obviously has no idea. And from the video, she's asked, do we know what they're shooting at or who is shooting? And again, they just have nothing on this. And the events are of such a nature that everything in the local area is just fried. All the all electronics are just shot, which if we remember from season one, what Mashak was saying about weird things happening on the the fringes of the outer colonies kind of fits the bill. 
Those um those guardians are re- looking rather suspicious. Yep. Mm-hmm. And if you've seen the, of course, the Halo Five opening cinematic, first thing Thomas Lasky says in the last seventy two hours, five colonies, and they do say five in the episode. Five colonies have been hit in the episode. Mm-hmm. Have been hit by forerunner forces, essentially, or forerunner for- s- sourced attacks. But maybe my timeline placement's a little messed up because I haven't. I've been thinking about this more, and I might be wrong, but the way I originally interpreted it is he says, like, yesterday we got these transmissions, so it depends on how fast it is, but it sounds like uh, Maya is being briefed on this two days before uh, before Osiris would be. Because by, then it had, by, by the time Osiris was briefed, it had been three days. I could see that as a very real possibility, because this is supposed to be taking place in the long side with halo five yep that would not surprise me at all i, th- I think you kind of I, th- I think you're actually onto something right there and mm-hmm. uh, i mean another part of this too is she asks well why haven't we sent in spartans and noah says well we we need to figure this out without sending in the cavalry we don't want to draw too much attention to it because we're, we're trying to keep it under wraps as it is but this one site is actually under new colonial alliance control and that's the one site that they're sending her out to because they need to figure out what's exactly going on. They need eyes and boots on the ground to figure it out. And because it's occupied by NCA people, I guess, couldn't find a better word for that, they need someone that can actually relate with them. And Maya says that she's brushed up against a few NCA factions before. So... It's not something that she's particularly fond of, of trying to do, but she should have a knack of being able to integrate with it. So she should, I mean, she's kind of the, the person for the job to, to figure out what's going on. Cause they, they still need to figure out what is happening to gather Intel from, from one of these colonies and, and figure out what's going on. And the NCA is also using this as a, a power play. So it's also kind of damage control as well. True. Yeah. So, <clears throat> After kind of discussing of, of what's really going on and what her job is actually going to be through all of this, uh, Pharaoh finally says that, okay, she'll do it. But um, she does ask the questions of, of why no cavalry, why no Spartans? And again, they need to understand the situation before they, they throw in the cavalry and need to have someone that the rebels can, can trust. And we actually, at, at this point, we're introduced to a character that we're all familiar with from the Kilo 5 trilogy, someone who will be accompanying Maya on this journey in the form of a <laughs> NCA pin. Um, people mentioned the uh, letters B earlier. Well, it's Black Box, our old friend Black Box. With the greatest smug English accented voice Oh, that was so ever. cool. Exactly. It's exact, like oh, I never I imagined him with an accent, but that smugness just oozed. It ah. was good. Oh, that is exactly how I, in my mind, that's exactly how I pictured his <laughs> voice. <laughs> it was good. Just the way you know the way they wrote his lines. That is exactly how yeah. I imagined his voice. This- Say hello, Bla- say hello to Black Box. Hello to Black Box. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> In my terrible impression, I, I didn't exactly imagine the like the the English accent part of it whenever I read it. Yeah. But the I mean, the smugness definitely fit the profile. The, the kind of yeah. like a little more slower, methodical voice and, and deep definitely rang with with BB. Oh yeah, <laughs> and. And of course, she can't help but put a fuss yeah, up no, about it because she's like, "Wait, I'm I'm being nannied on this mission. Like, what? What?" <laughs> I like how BB describes himself. Yeah, it's it's. it's <laughs> you mean you don't want to have an ultra high tech, uh, state of the art piece of hardware helping you on this? Yeah. Well, it's like it, and like we're going, we're being deployed on a high risk operation where you don't have a very well-established purview of the situation. So yeah, basically I'm I'm here to help <laughs> with something that's as high profile as this. And because they're trying to do damage control, it only makes sense. 
I can't wait to hear more about this mission. Well, we'll have to wait till Tuesday next week to find out. I know. And the weird part is too that Noah goes on to say there the info that they got on these attacks came from an unreliable source. And and she was like, Wait, we've known about these? And Noah's like, Yeah, but where we got this intel we've been it burned came from, from before. Someone who had burned Yeah. Who else thought Halsey right away? Actually, I didn't. Yeah, ne- actually, neither did I. Somebody else on Twitter pointed that out, but once they did, oh my god. It's like, wait a minute. Someone who knows about the attacks, or knows something about foreigners, and has burned Oni before. I mean, if we're talking at least within the realm of ca- established characters, Halsey is that person. I'm not saying she'll show up in the in the podcast, but... I think that was a reference to her. <laughs> See, no, they actually said who it was. No, uh, no, it came from it came from the, yeah, it came from their agent, but he got the intel from somebody who had burned Oni before. Right. Oh. Yeah, the agent's name was so Ari. Was like, it's like here's the intel I got as an Oni agent from this other person who we can't and, trust. You know, here's the source they had to vet it. Yeah, I guess I missed that reference. I went like somebody, like I said, somebody pointed it out on Twitter, and I went back and listened to it again because yeah, it's it's so fast. Mm-hmm. But uh, I went back and listened to it with that in mind, and it's it just kind of clicked and said in my head is like yeah, that's uh, that sounds like it could be. I maybe you know maybe too early to say, but it just you know we know Halsey knows about the Guardians, you know, that's why Osiris is going after her. So, and she, again, she's has burned Oni before. She's burned Oni several times, really. <laughs> if we get into some of that, but um, that's another discussion. Has she ever provided false information, though? No, no, not, I'm not saying false information, but she has... I mean, that's kind of the implication. She has manipulated information. She's manipulated, yeah, she's absolutely manipulated information. I guess that's true. Uh, I hate to bring this up, but it is canon... She apparently lied about the clones from uh, kept the clones from Oni, or at least kept them from Parangoski. Attempted so, to, yeah, or te- for at least long enough that you know it was already it already went on and she couldn't put a stop to it. Interesting. And then I mean, you, you have the most re- her most recent uh, kind of incidents of insubordination, you know, defecting to Jewel would. Uh, I mean, we we as fans know why that's going on, but. Not everyone in Oni would really understand that, and without a certain bird's, you know, again, like like Michael Sullivan said, they're not privy to information that kind of paints this stuff in a new light or in a different in the proper light. Let's say. Well, it's yeah, that's definitely something I I didn't really think about for some reason. Like I thought Mashak for some reason, but then instantly I'm like, yeah, that's not that's not the person. But thinking of of Halsey as a possibility, that's not too far fetched. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. Could be. But this is where we come to the conclusion of episode one. This is something that's bigger than Maya. She was dealing with having to address people before, and now she's having to deal with this massive unknown. And to her, all of humanity is at risk, so it's it's worth going on the mission. So, she's in for it. And until next week. Yeah. That's it for episode one. Uh, it's been there's a lot of stuff in here, and there's even stuff that we we tried talking about that will obviously tie back into season one that we're still trying to figure out. I mean, th- yep. there's so much stuff. I mean, I bet Toa, if, if you went back and listened to all of season one, like after each one of these episodes, your videos would be completely different. <laughs> Oh God, they would. Uh, there was so much that people that I got wrong that people got wrong. But doesn't that make you feel good? Yes, it does. Absolutely. I, like it's like I got it wrong, but it's I got it wrong in the best way. <laughs> yeah, I plan on this weekend going through the uh, first season to to do exactly that to see you know, what I remember getting wrong and right and just seeing how what I know now affects the previous story. <sighs> Cause there'll be, there'll be points where I'll come up with something totally different than I did the last time. Oh yeah. 
I might even have to listen to some old podcasts <laughs> or watch some old videos <laughs> of uh of Mr. Halo Cannons over here. But yeah, it's if you guys want a little more short succinct summaries instead of this big long podcast, then definitely check out Halo Cannon because he puts up some great synopses of all the episodes, which whenever we um make our posts, we'll actually go ahead and link the videos in there because they're they're really good. Oh, thank you. Well, you're on the podcast, so might as well plug it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, you do a great job on those. A Thank really you. great job on Definitely. those. Definitely. And there's also... I knew there was some reason you guys... <laughs> <didn't find me. laughs> um, but you also have... A, a, I mean, while you're here, it, it, it's best to go ahead and mention, you also did kind of like a, a character profile for each one of the uh, Fireteam Osiris and Blue Team members, too, on your site or on, on your channel. Yeah. Yeah, on YouTube. <laughs> I haven't watched them yet, but I've I've heard some great things about them. I need to to go watch them at some point. But if you guys are looking for kind of a, a backstory behind each one of the characters that you'll be playing as in the campaign, it sounds like those are great resources to go to. Yeah, they are. They are very well done, very well thought out. Um, it, it just I've watched five of them, I believe. Um, but they just absolutely have blown me away with um, you, how well you've put them together and the oh, amount of you. digging you've had, to, you have had to have done to get these put together. I am genuinely flattered. <laughs> I mean, I, pr- I pride myself <laughs> in you. like knowing a lot of the lore stuff that I do, but then when you're putting out all these videos, it's like, wow, there is so much out there that gets all intertwined together and related. And it's like, like you take it to another level. Like Jeff, obviously no one can match Jeff because he's just a, a crazy halo encyclopedia machine talking about grim yeah. brother one. It's like, I, I know a lot, but the second that he was able to cite the exact chapter in ghost of Onyx, that blue team shows up. I just, yep. I can't hold a torch to that. <laughs> <laughs> Something to aspire for. I'm assuming. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But definitely check out, Halo Cannon stuff, I would highly recommend going over there and like even watching the Fire Team Osiris and the Blue Team portfolio videos in a way. I think those are great things. I hope those eventually make it on the community updates. That that's a hint to that's a hint to crash to talk to Bravo. <laughs> um, actually the blue team video oh, didn't did? make it to the to oh, the good. Halo channel. Oh, good. Much to, yeah, much to my surprise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Never mind then. Yeah. There's n- already accomplished <laughs> but yeah, if i remember right i think you even saw it on halo channel yeah oh, that's cool. yeah exactly and nicely so, done really surprised well, about that <laughs> it, it's you earned it but, dude so that's that's awesome to you. see definitely well that's going to wrap it up for our episode i did say we were going to talk about the r3 lives twitter account and everything that's going on with that this next episode but since it's only been two days since the last one, that's not yeah. enough time. And I don't know if... Need to allow time for you to come to yes. the light and realize the yes. truth. Praise be to Dusk. Our, our transcendence must be embraced properly. So we will yes. hopefully study up on that for our next show, which will be another Hunt the Truth show because that's coming out on Tuesday next week. So for anyone that is confused... Yeah. But hopefully it'll just stay on Tuesday. So it is. Uh, I did. Bravo did put a yeah. tweet out. Uh, someone did ask the question. So, like from a lore perspective, as a fan perspective, it's awesome. But as a content producer, it's like God. Oh damn it. yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. I have a life. <laughs> I know, right? I had a life. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm not gonna have a life for the next three months, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Are any of us? <sighs> Good point. But yeah, so we did get confirmation uh, from Bravo. He posted a tweet out in response to someone else earlier where the episodes are coming out on Tuesdays. Today was just a special week because they did put the pilot out on Tuesday and they didn't want to put episode one out on the same day. So they went to space it out. So it came out on Thursday. So we bumped back our last light show. We're going to do it. I don't think we'll do it next week. I think we're going to do it the week after because we do have our podcast set up with the 405th and i am really excited about that one so i 
don't want to bump that back with the risk of them not being able to make any of the weeks after leading up to launch. So we're going to keep that one on the time slot for October 1st. Yeah, October 1st. So that's going to be our fourth, fifth show. Uh, Tuesday, we're obviously going to do our next Hunt the Truth because that'll be the regular releases. And then we'll keep on doing them on Tuesdays. And then we'll be doing Last Light on... That would make it the 8th. I don't think we have anything scheduled for the 8th already. I'll have to go back and check to see what we already have on the list of podcasts for us. But we are doing a lot of stuff leading up to the uh the launch because and for those that haven't noticed uh, a lot of halo 5 info is coming out uh we did get <clears throat> the release of blue team and enemy lines two campaign missions from halo and they're actually not that spoilery in terms of what you're going through in mission so if you're looking to stay spoiler free they're actually all right <laughs> to go look at in terms of of just gameplay so i would say you're safe with those. Yeah, I'm guessing the I'm guessing the creators or the uh, people who captured that were required not to put too many spoilers in. Basically, it's like all of that, all of the videos from everybody that was lucky enough to get to play all that stuff. It seems like they they've been avoiding spoilers like the plague. So that must be a part of their contract. So there or, is some uh, stuff the that NDA, we, whatever it is. Yep, yeah, there is some stuff that we could not include uh, that we were told you. You cannot show any mention of this whatsoever. Um, I will say that those pieces do explain or do set up pretty well the purpose of Halo 5 Guardians. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Gleam on that what you will. But yeah, there there is definitely some stuff. And I mean, that's the reasons why you're not seeing any cutscenes. Or you saw the opening to Blue Team, which... Is an awesome freaking cutscene, by the way. If you oh haven't seen it, oh my god, that was <laughs> so I, cool. That's the that's part is just they land in, they let themselves slide back, and then activate the boosters at the right moment and the magnet boots at the right moment. It's like I just love that. Stop, slide back. Yep. Yeah. It's like me too. psych. <laughs> yep. And that that uh, was the point where I'm like, have the covenant not learned to have magnet boots on? Really. Well, I think they were more focused on killing the intruders than activating mag boots. Surprise, John one one seven. Yeah, but what if the the gravity system goes off? The artificial gravity. If if I remember correctly, their standard combat armor is not vacuum tight. They actually have vacuum suits that they wear whenever they're expected to be out okay, of the pressurized enough. environment. Fair enough. Yeah. And that's especially true with the with uh, Jules Covenant because some of them can't even afford sleeves. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to bring up some of those old Halo Four. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, oh gosh, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff that has been coming out, and we will be getting to that hopefully here soon. We will be releasing some more content if you're listening to us on thursday which is when we're actually recording this we have some arena footage coming out starting tomorrow so if you're up in the wee hours of the morning you'll see some of it if not you'll catch it in the at the beginning we're actually um doing two sets of releases so we're going to be releasing our arena stuff tomorrow and then we're going to actually spread that over um a few hours so that you're not completely inundated with footage. And then we're going to be doing our breakout stuff on Saturday. So we, I have, I think, four games of breakout and maybe five or six games of arena that we'll be posting. So make sure you're, if you're not already subscribed to head over to podtagler.com slash YouTube, subscribe to the channel and you'll get to see all those videos and all that playing made me really want halo 5 already because <laughs> i can't wait much longer hey at least you got to play it that is true it just, it don't just you want me to play complain. more <laughs> no you don't get to complain fair fair enough i guess but yeah so check out yeah. our yeah, content. yes i'm sure he did pins <laughs> did you camp the grenade spawn again what <laughs> uh somebody's extermination that oh, he posted on youtube oh 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 um no 
No, I did not camp any grenade spawns. I don't think there were any other areas where there were that many clusters of grenades on any of the breakout maps I played. Well, good. I'm glad they fixed that one. <laughs> hey, those six grenades were helpful. <laughs> Trench was an interesting map. <laughs> yes, it was a very interesting map. Uh, I did get a few more of the um, extinction medals. That's where you actually, you're the one that kills all four of the enemy team. Mm -hmm. I did get a couple of those. So you'll see those. But yeah, so that that content is coming out starting tomorrow. So make sure you check that out. Uh, and that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. Make sure you check out uh, the rest of our social networks. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I already told you about YouTube. And if you're listening to this after the fact, we're on Twitch. We have our game night tomorrow night hosted by the lovely Godzilla T, which will be on the Master Chief Collection starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 p.m. Pacific. So make sure you jump in on for some MCC action. We got the Halo hype train coming down. So hop on the hype train and come play some fun customs and matchmaking with us on your Friday nights. We also have our Man Up Mondays that's hosted by Hassas, where he plays with one of the other guys over from Rectified Gaming. Uh, that's not necessarily a community interactive one, but that is something where if you're looking for some uh, late night Halo streams, then you can definitely head on over and watch that on Mondays. Usually starts around, I want to say 10 p.m. Pacific time because um, Haas is over in Washington. So he's on, on that time zone. So if he's you're looking... over on the, the wrong coast. <laughs> he's on the good coast. What are you talking about? <laughs> I say they make Halo over there, so I wouldn't say it's the wrong coast. Yeah. No, he's on the right beach, just the wrong coast. I'm uh... confused. Anyways, make sure you check out the podcast network. We are a part of a conglomerate a network of gaming specific podcasts. Uh, and you can check that out over at podka.st with other podcasts like guardian radio, crits cast, the learning cliff work in progress and how to murder time. And also make sure you check out uh, again, halo cannon, Toa freak, all of his videos over on YouTube. If you just search halo cannon, you will find him. He's not that hard to find has lots of great videos out there. Definitely recommend you check out, the hunt the true stuff if you need a refresher and if you don't feel like going through all of our podcasts but i think it'd be cool if you do you can definitely check his videos i think each one of his analysis videos are anywhere between six and nine minutes long for all the season one stuff and it's kind of similar at least from the episode zero that i saw that of like was it nine minutes for the one that you did on tuesday something like that yeah, yeah so definitely check those out over on his youtube channel and that'll be wrapping up for us or, or yeah do both Hey, Luke Cannon and Podtacular. Yeah, you can listen to our... Get as much perspective as you can. <laughs> yeah, our hour and a half to two hour podcast, and then you can get a, a nine minute video. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say do both, you know? You, you watch the nine minute video when you're in a rush, and then when you have a couple hours, you just, you know, yeah, if, if load you something really... up on your i load, load some Podtacular up on your iPod and yeah. listen to that while you're doing some work or something. If you want your brains really racked and if you really want to just, just get all sorts of confused and all sorts of befuddlement, then yeah, listen to our podcast. If you want just the, the details, then just go watch the videos. <laughs> or if you're crazy and you just want Halo all the time, then go ahead and do both. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. There you go. Well, that'll wrap it up for us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again, uh, Toa Freak, for coming on our show, being a wonderful part of our journey down hunting the truth once again, this is such a great start episode. Just, even the pilot was amazing, but episode one, oh my gosh, all the feels are still there. Even more feels than season one had just right out of the gate, just completely crushing it. Uh, huge shout outs to Noah and Ian and everyone who's was working on this. Like, it, it This is awesome. This, this is fantastic. I, I am loving it every second of this so keep up the great work over there guys most definitely guys oh yes we will Absolutely. see you guys next week on tuesday for episode two of hunt the truth keep on shining and continue to pursue transcendence falling in the ways of dask Gavadim. <laughs>